Yeah, doing their homework in homeroom. I was still goofing around with this 10 minutes ago. So, um, so my name is Trevor Pierce. I'm going to be talking about um, what I'm calling existential web performance, how milliseconds make the internet a happy place. And uh, to me, web performance is its more than, it, it ends with your end users, how quickly your site or your application loads for them, you know, how satisfied they are with what, I, what uh, Twitter calls time to live, you know, how quickly, from the time I enter the URL, can I start doing something interesting? You know, when, when can I see the page painted without jank? When can I sign up? When can I start tweeting? When can I do things? But I think it starts a lot sooner than that. I think it starts with with you, the developer, um, with your thought process, with the things you do uh, to keep yourself on task, um, to not uh, lose, or to not get taken out of flow any more than is going to happen throughout the day with interruptions, with instant messages, and phone calls. Um, and I'm going to talk about you know some of the things I've done um, or some of the things I do now for myself. Um, so I so my mind doesn't wander, so I don't spend an inordinate amount of time um, you know, looking for files or doing repetitive tasks that uh, just kind of take the joy out of programming for me. So like I said, uh, my name is Trevor Pierce. Um, I am actually a user interface and user experience designer who uh, kind of got thrown in to the deep end of the front end. Um, my development team was at a scrape a few years ago and they said, well, we know you can write style sheets. So uh, here's a set of keys. Um, the server is here. This is a thing called Vim, and you're going to learn to use it. And so I uh, took a crash course in Vim, and here I am three years later still using it and uh, still writing front end. Um, my development team has, uh, I'm not sure if it was affectionately, but they have referred to me as a, a pain in the backside. Um, use your own adjective there. Um, because I'm constantly after them about things like accessibility, um, front end web performance, um, and user advocacy. I'm like, Yes, we can do it this way, but we should do it this other way because, and they're like, let me guess, performance, accessibility, user advocacy, I'm like, yes. So obviously, um, you know, it, it's resonating with them, and um, you know, at least I'm being consistent. You know, stumping for my users and making sure that we're building cutting-edge products, but we're doing it in an accessible and performant fashion. And so, some of the things that have helped me. Um, and I've boiled down into the five rules of, of web design. Um, I maybe could have called that the five rules of web design 4B, um, but I hope they have some a little bit. Uh, I hope they have some broader appeal. Um, the first one is don't waste your own time. It's how the world ends up with Farmville. And I will expand on these a little more. Uh, the second one, uh, write as little code as you have to. But if you have to, write good code. Uh, rule number three: one big file is better than three small files. Uh, rule number four, one small file is better yet than one big file. And rule number five, uh, inline is not a dream. So in thinking about, and before I get started with the uh, uh, with what I'm doing with these things, I guess I'll do the obligatory, you know, my tools of choice. Um, you know, I use Chrome pretty, pretty extensively because um, the developer tools are what I feel like are second to none. Um, it's a lightweight browser. It's, doesn't seem to have the memory or performance issues that Firefox at least used to have. Um, Node and Express, because Node, you know, you know, it packages or gives you NPM, which is a great package manager, and you know, kind of sets the stage for, um, you know, for using like Browserify type modules, and kind of taught me a little bit about streams. Uh, Express is great for just if you need a basic server, so you can do um, AJAX requests. You know, you don't have files that used to allow you to do uh, things with JavaScript, Express gets you up and running in 10 or 15 lines. Um, I use iTerm and Vim um, just because, uh, like I said, I got thrown into it once and I found myself having less uh, repetitive stress issues uh, with my wrists where I was using Vim and moving around by the keyboard instead of a mouse half the time. Uh, I'm using Gulp now to string everything together and as my task runner, I've previously done everything with Grunt, um, but it seemed like all the blogs I was reading and the people I was following um, seemed like they were all kind of drifting towards Gulp, and then I read uh, LibSass, um, was written in C, and took a SAS preprocessor previously from Ruby, 
and rewrote it in C and it was significantly faster. I was like, okay, I'm sold and I was cutting over. Um, auto prefixer, again, because it looks through my style sheets and it tells me what vendor prefixes I need so I don't have to think about it. I don't have to waste a second, you know, writing big scenes or downloading something heavy like Bourbon or Compass that I usually don't use. Um, Browse Verify, again, you know, has the, the um, same module include structure as Node. And I was like, you know, previously I've used Require.js and AMD, and I always end up with circular dependencies because I'm a dumb and I've never really figured out how to use Require. So I just, you know, I saw Browse Verify, I saw it instantly what I could do with it, scratched it. And jQuery, because jQuery is where I learned, and that's probably not the right way to learn JavaScript, but, uh, you know, that's, again, I had a need. I had something with a deadline, and so jQuery got me from here to there and uh, kind of started me down this path. So uh, rule number one is, uh, for me, is don't waste your own time. Like I said, it's how the world ends up with Farmville. And uh, uh, I have a saying that um, days are lost a second at, or seconds at a time. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, think about a typical day where you know, a phone call might take five minutes, or you might wait for a file, or for files like style sheets to compile, it takes 10 seconds, or you spend a couple of minutes looking for a Word document or something the boss sent to you. Well, by themselves, those interruptions and disruptions or loss of time don't sound all that impressive, but you know, by the end of the week, you may have lost a couple of hours, and by the end of the year, you've lost several days. And you know, they individually, they're insignificant, but over time, they do add up. And that time that gets lost, it's time you're not spending coding. It's time you're not spending thinking about your code. Um, it's time you might be thinking, or your mind might be wandering onto building something like the next farm bill, and then you know you look up and you've lost you know, more time, and uh, you still haven't done or found what you were looking for to begin with. Um, and good practices take time. You know things like uh, writing automated tests. Uh, you know small as unit tests all the way up to uh, functional regression tests, uh, accessible markup, semantic HTML, these things all take time. And by giving, by clawing your time back a few seconds at a time, you, you give yourself the space to do the thinking required to really write good code the first time and not have to, I mean, there's always going to be refactoring, there's always going to be changing requirements, but if you can give yourself some space and some breathing room to really think about it the first time. Um, you know, it really does pay dividends down the line. Okay, so I'm going to um, show some code samples out of my gold file, and then I'll have, uh, I'll show some live coding at the end to show how I'm actually putting these into practice. Um, so the first task is uh, my SAS task, and uh, I make extensive use of SAS because I can write uh, I can write SAS and compile to CSS, um, you know, 33 to 50 percent faster than I can write just standard CSS. I, I don't. I make heavy use of makes ends and extends and placeholders, and it gives me, you know, it just gives me a lot of efficiencies. And uh, when I found I could use source maps that could look into my SAS files and look into my partials. Um, without actually having to look into the compiled style sheet, I immediately you know, look for ways to put these things together. And Gulp gives me uh, a means to do that. So when the task kicks off, uh, I'm using a plugin called Plumber just to keep the stream moving. If there's any errors, it will report them, but it won't uh, stop the task. Um, then initiating the style, or I'm sorry, initiating the source map, catching any errors, writing the source map, um, then, you know, towards the bottom where it says pipe filter, I'm having to sort of protect auto prefixer from the source map. Auto prefixer does not play well with source maps, and the only way to be able to use auto prefixer to look at this, the final style sheet and have it uh, bolt on the browser or vendor prefixes where I needed them was to kind of shelter it from the source map. So hide the source map, run auto prefixer, restore the source map. And finally, output everything into one compiled style sheet. So the second rule of code is write as little code as you have to, but you know if you have to, um, write good code. And by that I mean no matter what my parents tell me, or no matter what your parents have told you, 
I feel like lazy is a virtue. And by that I mean, the less code I actually write, uh, is less code I have to debug, number one. And number two, is I lower the probability that I'm going to introduce errors, the less uh, characters I have on the page. And um, you know, where I am not, a, where I am developed as, as often as I can, but it's not, you know, it's not what I do every single day. There might be, you know, days or weeks between you know, when I drop or when I put down a JavaScript file and when I pick it back up. So I'm going to make errors at a rate higher than most people normally would. So uh, being able to do things to lessen the likelihood of that um, keeps me moving and gets me moving faster. And I also try to approach um, code writing like an author. And by that I mean I try to write with the end in mind. So if I'm building uh, a module that's going to do something like look at all of my uh, main page navigation and on click it's going to um, make an AJAX call that's going to go just grab a, a chunk of data and not do a full page refresh. Well, I know what I want it to do and so I know what the end looks like for that module and so I approach it that way and it, it, that helps me frame how I want to test it and it also helps me decide when the module is done. It also gives me a line in the sand to say, should this function live in the module I'm working on, or should I start something new? You know, it, it very it gives me some clear delineations and uh, you know some training wheels, for lack of a better word, and keeps you know kind of keeps things small and concise, and uh, lets me not uh, be afraid to break into new modules or break things out um, and refactor. And one of the big things um, that I use uh, pretty much for all of my style sheets and for my JavaScript are linters. You know, I found a great plugin called uh, SAS or SCSS Lint uh, that does for SAS style sheets and looks at the name, looks at the uh, SAS before it's compiled to CSS, and gives you a printout of all the errors you're making or all the things you're doing, like conflating uh, tabs and spaces or you know, you've, you've missed an include declaration, or you've missed a semicolon. Um, and it does very much what like a JS hint or a JS lint does uh, for style sheets. Um, so I, I make heavy use of both of those tasks of linters for uh, CSS, for SAS, and JavaScript. And so anytime I run the SAS build task, it automatically kicks off this lint task as well. So I can see very quickly, did this the style sheet compile? And did I do anything dumb, or did I leave any uh, clearing errors that should be corrected? And I know that's getting awfully uh, pedantic and you know very down in the weeds, but again, I feel like if I write the code right the first time, or if I enforce good practices on myself, I'm again less likely to make errors, and I will write it faster um, because the the right way of doing it becomes uh, committed to muscle memory sooner. So my third rule for uh, uh, front-end development or for web design is one big file is better than, than uh, three small ones. And uh, what I mean by that is um, when a page is requested, so like if I say subdomain.com, the, whatever the first page is, the browser is looking at that and it's saying, okay, I see three style sheets, I see two scripts, and these are all in the head uh, before I even get to the body of the browser. Those are blocking requests by default. The browser has to stop, has to look at a style sheet, has to evaluate that this is a style sheet, it's an external file, has to go find it, request the payload, wait for it to come back, evaluate it, move to the next one. And if you have multiple files, all you're doing is frustrating your users. Then their attention span is short. Somewhere you know, along the lines of two to three seconds, if there's not things rendering that they're ready to start interacting with or that's catching their attention, they're liable to move on. And one of the first things I look to do is to gather up all of my style sheets, gather up all of my JavaScript, and plunk them into one big file each. Now, I'm not, I will get to minification and to, you know, uglifying those files and, and compressing them. The first part of that is to compress them down into one big file from two or three smaller ones. So here, um, Again, you know, looking at one of my goal tasks, this one is called build index. And with this one, all I'm doing um, when I run this task is I'm looking at, uh, in my app folder, which is my active uh, development folder, I'm looking for the index.html file. 
And uh, I'm looking specifically for CSS or for removed declarations and specially, uh, and specially formatted comments. That is, uh, it's going to change um, what the link looks like to the style sheet. So I can just say, look for just this one style sheet. It's called main.css, and here's where it's located. Um, some of the JavaScript, like for uh, browser sync or for live reload, you know, things I use so I don't have to keep hitting uh, Command R, it goes through and removes those, and it just gets, it strips out all of the things that are useful in development that, that you don't want in your actual build for testing or for a performance evaluation, and removes them for me. So it gets me, it gets me ready to, uh, to look at it as a user might look at it at the end. Uh, rule number four is one small file is better than one big file. So now that I've you know gathered up all of my all of my SAS partials, all 10, 12, 15 of them, both of them all together into one style sheet, gathered up all of my JS modules, both of them together into one file. Now I need to compress that file down. You know, I really want to um, only include just the things that I have to include. And the first step of that obviously is minifying, you know, looking at Taking all of it, stripping out all the white space, stripping out all the special characters, jamming it onto as few lines as possible. That doing that alone is going to cut down, you know, anywhere from I've seen 10 to 15 percent savings in file size. And in some files, you know, if you use a lot of comments, if you use a lot of white space, uh, the the savings add up pretty quickly. Uh, the other part of this of uh, minification is taking that a step further and looking into files and having the computer go in and tell you or determine for you, given this style sheet of some arbitrary size, half the selectors, half the rules in it, you're not even using. So I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna cut them, oh, I'm gonna cut them out of your style sheet and I'm gonna save it for you. Um, there's a number of uh, different tasks or different uh, tasks or plugins I've seen for this. Um, you can write bulk tasks, you can write grunt tasks. Um, there's a couple of specialized tools called Broccoli and Brunch. Um, I've never done anything with any of them other than a uh, gold task that I'll show here in a minute. Um, and how it works is it goes through, it looks for your index files that you're declaring. So in this case, I'm looking for, in my app directory, my, my app uh, development directory, I'm looking for anything that ends in .html because um, the site I'm working on here is just a static HTML site, you know, nothing fancy, just a personal site. So I'm looking for those files, and I'm going to ask it to give me everything. I'm going to ask it to look through there and decide in that main.css file what doesn't need to be there. And the task goes through and starts a phantom.js instance in the background that's running headlessly. It's comparing my style sheet to, I presume, to the, to the CSS selectors. Uh, it's seeing, or the elements it's seeing on the page, it's doing some kind of diffing. It's saying, you have a style sheet that's 300 lines long, half of it is not needed. I'm going to cut them loose and I'm going to save your style sheet back down. And now, uh, when it comes out on the other end with the same name, but gets dropped into my build folder, uh, and it notifies me that, hey, your main.css file is now you know, half as large as it was because I've gone in and I've stripped out everything you don't need. And rule number five is inline is not a dirty word. And um, it used to be, if, you, if you've read any HTML emails, you know you're very, but unfortunately very familiar with inline CSS writing and you know how wrong that feels and anything that was output by Dreamweaver. Um, style sheets were often inline on the element tags and it was just very messy. And um, you know, I've, I've learned from the, from the day I picked up style sheets and started writing was that you, you always use an external declaration. And for the most part, that's true. Uh, until you're talking about um, something called critical path, and um, ideally, which the, the best case scenario is when someone first hit your site, first hits your site, some domain.com, they've never hit it before, they have nothing cached, um, the, the pump has to be primed, so to speak. All that CSS has to be evaluated, all that JavaScript, everything has to be evaluated. And, you know, users are impatient. So in the interest of getting of cutting down on time to live, or making or making it appear as you're cutting down on time to live, um, there's a way to go through to evaluate the page to see in a frame of a certain size, you know, a certain width and height, 
these are the style sheet rules you need. Take them out of your style sheet, drop them into a style declaration in the head of the document, and render them in line, which ends up being a non-blocking uh, rendering. It can, the browser can be working on that while it's looking for the next file, the next external file to evaluate. Um, taking this a step further, when you have uh, inline styles, now you can do something that Zach Leatherman touched on a couple of months ago with the load CSS. And it's a simple JavaScript that uh, Filament Group wrote that allows you to asynchronously, using JavaScript, drop your um, style sheet declaration on the page for your full external style sheet. And so you have the inline styles, it looks like the page, or it looks like everything in the, your initial frame is styled. And it's going ahead and loading your full style sheet asynchronously in a non-blocking manner. So you're getting, you're building that cache, but you're also getting, you're delivering to users what looks like a fully featured page, um, you know, just that much quicker. And keeping them happy and keeping them on your site. And so this is the code I used to support that. The first, um, to use the critical task, the first thing you have to do is uh, target the style sheet you're going to use. You have to duplicate it um, and give it a new name. So you, you're, what you're saying is, I'm going to do something, I'm going to tear this style sheet apart, but first I'm going to park it, I'm going to duplicate it, park it in another file. Um, and then when the, when the uh, copy styles task is finished, the critical task will kick off, and again, it will look at the main style sheet, you know, given the style target, and the HTML target, you know, where do you want these inline styles to appear. And you give it a width and a height, because it, it also uses Phantom JS to uh, run a headless instance. It will look at the page, it will evaluate what styles it needs to be inline, what have to be there, given the window of this uh, size and parameter. Uh, minify it and drop it into a, into a style declaration in the head of the page. Critical also gives you the load CSS JavaScript for free. It drops it on the page right behind your inline styles. So. Uh, for the cost of the one gulp task, you have you have essentially offloaded um, a good chunk of your CSS right into the page, and um, you didn't have to do other than write for other than type out gulp critical. You didn't have to. Do. All right, so now I'm gonna I'm gonna step through these with live coding. Um, I really do hope this works. Uh, as of this morning at seven o'clock, everything was working, nothing was failing. So um, we are going to give it a go. So I have my uh, Express servers running, and so now I can go over here and get started with it. And this is my, my Gulp file, you know, that has all of my tasks. And uh, Gulp allows you to do some pretty cool things by defining your tasks, um, like a SAS lint task or a SAS task. You can inline one task into another. So when I run my SAS task here in a second, it will uh, both create the style sheet for me, but it's also going to run SAS Lint, which ends up being really useful because I can see have I made errors at the same time I'm compiling. So let's try that. Okay, so it looks like, um, so my file did concatenate. I do, when I go over, if I look through the uh, build directory now, I'll see I do have my main.css, and looking at all of these errors, each one of these lines is uh, something that the SAS lint task caught and said, hey, you know, you're doing a lot of things wrong according to uh, the basic style sheet. Now this is all configurable, so if you, know, if you prefer uh, spaces over tabs or tabs over spaces, um, you can set a YAML file uh, to suppress some of these errors, but um, it gives a pretty good idea quickly you know, where the errors are, what you're doing wrong, um, how you might fix that.
Now, admittedly, this um, this page is not going to win any design awards at the moment. Um, it's a personal site that has been in uh, design purgatory for the last nine years. So, um, please bear with me. But now, when you look at this, I have my CSS.main file, and it's taken uh, all of my it's taken all of my uh, SAS partials, and there's about four of them right now, and it's bolted them together uh, into one file for me. I didn't have to do anything else with that. So the next thing I will do, uh, when I'm ready to look at a file, or when I'm ready to look at the whole thing and start really doing uh, performance evaluation, um, I'll go ahead and run my gulp build tab. And that's going to that's going to do a number of things for me. It's going to run my CSS minification. Um, it's going to run my JavaScript minification and uglifying. Uh, or first, it's going to remove the build directory for me. So every time I run this gulp build task, it's going to delete my build directory, so I can start fresh every time. Um, it'll then go ahead and go through and uglify all my JavaScript using Browserify and uh, uh, JS uh, uglify, and I will copy that into the build lib directory. I will minify and remove all my unused CSS, and then I can go back to the build view. So now I can look at that. And so now I can get a better idea of now I can get a better idea of how quick uh, my time in live is. And <clears throat> I'm sorry that uh, you know when I changed the resolution, it kind of blew my my timeline right out the window. But um, doing it this way, I can see you know what the time in live looks like and uh, where uh, pieces are being rendered and how quickly. And this is before I've applied my uh, my goal critical, uh, which is the final uh, transformation I'll do. And running this again, this one kind of loops back through uh, the build task. It steals some of the same tasks as build. Um, it will copy the index file. It will run the minification. Uh, it will you know, again look for all the CSS, and it doesn't look like it's done anything interesting, but. If we go back to the build index file, now you can see right here that a critical has gone through and this style declaration wasn't there before and neither was the script underneath it. Critical has gone through, it's determined uh, these 15 rules are what it needs uh, to render a 1024 by 768 page immediately and it has dropped in the filament group uh, load CSS file, or I'm sorry, load CSS script and it's also dropped in a no script tag. So if someone does happen to hit my page uh, with JavaScript disabled, they're still going to be able to load it. They're not going to get any of the performance uh, upgrades, uh, but they're not going to, you know, they're not going to see a, an unstyled page either. So using all of these things together, um, it allows me to <coughs> it allows me to work much more efficiently and more quickly. I don't spend nearly the amount of time in Control R, Control R, Control R to reload the browser. Um, I usually let a task like uh, Browser Sync or Live Reload handle that for me. Uh, I don't spend any more time than I have to debugging files because it tells me, it gives me just, uh, detailed descriptions of where the errors are, you know, what I'm doing wrong with uh, the way I'm writing things, um, and I'm able to keep, you know, I don't have to think quite as much about performance because I've, I've uh, built a set of tools that do a lot of that thinking for me and do a lot of the things that I feel like are best practices on the front end for me. And so then I can, again, I can sort of offload some of that thinking to the machine and I can you know, focus on things the machine can't do so well, like semantic HTML or adding uh, area markup, you know, describing things um, to a screen reader or, you know, building um, a module in the best way possible or with the right markup. Um, you know, so it's targetable, so it's, you know, so Google can look at it and see um, what's going on. 
Um, some next steps for this, um, I'm definitely, I have a lot of JavaScript modules that I need to backfill to, uh, to use CommonJS standard. Um, this, I sort of took an existing code base with a front workflow and ripped it all up and uh, rebuilt it with uh, Gulp and, and Browse Verify from the ground up. So if, if I was making a bad analogy, it would be like renovating an entire house at once. Um, so there's still a lot of uh, work in progress. I need to add a gulp watch task to it so I don't have to manually keep typing gulp sass or gulp browse verify. It will just watch for changes to CSS, to sass, to JavaScript, and um, run the task and reload the page for me. Uh, and when it's all done, when I'm all done with that, I will probably port this to a Yeoman generator and put it on make it available on GitHub or make it available on a Yeoman's website. So if anyone is interested in using these tools, you know, or speeding up um, their front end or speeding up performance, uh, they can uh, download Yeoman, they can run uh, Yo, you know, the name of this generator, and it will give them, you know, the, the Gulp file, the index file, the JavaScript, the SAS files, and um, basically stand up all the dependencies so that then you can just be off. Yeah, thank you.